Hello, and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. The Element 14 community and Metcal sent me this GT120 soldering iron. As usual, when that happens, I get to pick the topic. So I got to thinking, even with a high-end soldering station, what could we do to improve our soldering skills? In this video, while we show off the iron, I also cover flux, tips, the soldering kind, and temperature techniques. If you're new to soldering, then these are going to be a good starting point. And if you're experienced, then these could be a refresher. With that, let's go solder. Even though this is an episode about the iron, let's start with something completely unrelated to it. Without knowing anything about what you're doing, I know that you could be using more flux. Flux helps clean and prepare the surfaces being soldered. It burns up contaminants and etches through light oxide layers for a better bond. Using it is easy. Apply it and then, well, solder. Personally, I like this tacky style. In a past episode, we covered flux types in more detail. The wire solder you should be using should contain a flux core. And if the solder you have has no flux core, it probably wasn't meant for electronics. A common mistake I see people make is they get a big blob of solder on their iron and then try to apply that to the surfaces to join. The problem is that there's no flux left to clean the surface first. Now, to address the curmudgeons that like to say, you don't need flux or you shouldn't use so much flux, I agree with you. Also, you're wrong. For almost anyone, using more flux is going to be more helpful than not. And as you get better, you can get away with using less. For me, I'd rather do a little extra cleaning afterward than brag that I'm really good at soldering without using it. Also, for those using lead-free solder, make sure that the flux you're using is intended for its higher temperatures. I mean, most are, but it's a good thing to check. Speaking of temperatures, let's talk about that next. Very often, I get asked what temperature I solder with, and guess what? It doesn't really matter what number I tell you. Depending on your iron, workpiece, the solder you're using, and your own skill level, that number is different. So instead, let's talk about how to find a good temperature. First, know your solder type's melting point. Obviously, if you try soldering at that temperature, you're going to have a bad time. Increasing the temperature of the iron accelerates the heat transfer from the tip to the work surfaces, which allows solder to flow correctly. So why not just crank it all the way up to the max? Well, one reason is that the extra heat will oxidize the tip more quickly, and if you get too much oxidation, you may not be able to use the tip anymore. Another reason is from about one minute ago. Remember, there is flux in the solder. If the heat is too high, the flux never gets a chance to do its thing. As you feed solder into the joint, you really want to make sure that the solder touches the work field and not the iron. That way, it melts the solder, exposing the flux, which cleans the area before it boils away. Related to temperature and oxidation, keep your tip clean and tinned with fresh solder. If you're relatively new, then I recommend cleaning your tip very frequently. Coming back to the question of which temperatures do I use, I have three starting points. For different tasks, I have a low, medium, and high temperature preset. Generally, I use 250 degrees C when working with bismuth solder or very small components. The high temperature range is useful when using desoldering braid. And my general purpose starting point for lead-based solder is 350 degrees Celsius. Since these are starting points, one of the things I watch is how often is the iron heating. Some stations offer a visual indication like an LED when the heater is turned on. This one shows a percentage. You can use that information to get an idea of how well heat is transferring between the iron and the workpiece. For example, if the iron is working too hard or it's on constantly, it might suggest you need to increase your set point temperature or it could mean you need to change the tip. Even if your soldering station comes with a tip, it may not be ideal for the work that you're doing. Very common, I see people attempting to use a conical or sharp tip when they really shouldn't. Don't go poking this into the work area. Soldering is all about surface area. Instead, use the edge of the tip to touch as much work area as possible to help transfer the heat. My preferred tip style is the chisel. It looks like a slotted screwdriver. I find these to be the most versatile. For example, on through hole parts, they easily heat up the pad and post. They're also pretty good when using desoldering braid and it works well for even surface mount components. Regardless of the tip type, matching the size to the work being done is important. When choosing a soldering iron, make sure that it has a wide range of tips and styles available. By the way, when I said not to use a solder bubble, 
When drag soldering, you actually do want a bubble of solder on the tip, but notice that I've added extra flux and I'm feeding fresh solder into the bubble. Good soldering irons have a way to change their tips, so make sure you know how to do it for yours so that you can match the tip style to the work that you're doing. Now, if you can only have one tip, I recommend a chisel. My preferred size is around two millimeters, but that's because I do a lot of small scale DC electronics and it works really well. Ideally, I suggest having one of each of those tip styles in your kit so that you can find out which one works best for you. Before closing, there is one more thing I want to cover, and that is never put a iron directly onto a table. When on, your soldering iron should only be in one of two places, your hand or its stand. And if your station offers it, make use of its sleep and standby modes. These will save energy and put less wear on the tips. Just a heads up, the Element 14 community ran a road test on the GT120. So if you'd like to see some reviews from community members, follow the link below. As always, that is the best place to ask me questions because I'm more likely to see and be able to answer them over there. Thank you for watching. For now, it is time for me to get back to soldering on my electronics workbench.